Aloha everyone and welcome to Lillian's Vegan World. I'm your host Lillian Kumik coming to you live from downtown Honolulu, part of the Think Tech Hawaii team of citizen journalists. Welcome to our show. Today's episode is called Preventing Disease with Plants, the Power of a Plant-Based Diet. It is with great honor that I welcome uh, today's guest all the way from Monterey, California, Dr. Stephen Loam, Doctor of Cardiovascular Disease, Lifestyle Medicine from the Community Hospital of the Monterey Peninsula. Dr. Loam, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be invited on the show. The pleasure is all mine. And may I first uh, start by saying thank you so much for all that you do. I can imagine this has been a incredible uh, journey through the pandemic and what you do and the time that you take to share the other part of your uh, passion, which is the which is the vegan lifestyle is incredible. So thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely, it's my passion as, as is with many people. <laughs> Dr. Loam, uh, may I ask you to please introduce yourself and, and your affiliations, what you what you do apart from being uh, an amazing cardio cardiologist. Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, I am a, a cardiologist and I'm board certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular disease, and more recently, lifestyle medicine using a diet and other lifestyle approaches as the primary treatment for prevention and reversal of chronic diseases. So I practice uh, out here in Monterey, California, uh, a general cardiology practice with a strong, strong focus on prevention and, and lifestyle medicine. Fantastic. So today we are going to go through some studies that you have um, you've been promoting. You've been working on on stuff, and, and honestly, I think today's today's episode of the show is going to blow people away. The one thing that uh, popped out when I uh, since I've been following you, and we will mention to the viewers how they can uh, make sure they can see what you're getting up to and follow follow you was that you mentioned something like exercise is only 20% of, uh, of, of the jigsaw puzzle and 80% being what we eat. So let's start from the beginning. What, what is your take on the plant-based diet in regards to health? Well, that, that's absolutely true. And, and my whole journey is, I think, a, a journey that many people can uh, potentially connect with because I got into lifestyle medicine and, and healthy eating personally, uh, because I was nearly 100 pounds heavier about five or six years ago, my health was starting to fall apart. I was a cardiologist in a busy practice and developing high blood pressure, sleep apnea, back pain, fatigue, acid reflux, all these different things. And I kind of had my aha moment that I had to uh, do something about my own health. Growing up on a standard American diet, my parents both being close to 300 pounds, my sister being 450 pounds in high school. I quickly learned as I was trying to recapture my own health that, hey, the most important aspect of it is actually diet because I made a lot of mistakes like many people do when they try to recapture their health. A lot of times their focus is on exercise, exercise, exercise. And so silly me made a, quite the mistake of uh, first thing I did when I was trying to get healthy is I signed up for a marathon, 260 pound guy. And I think to myself, hey, look, all these marathon runners are thin. They look great, they look healthy, right? Uh, maybe that's what I'll do. I'll just start running like crazy and I'll lose some weight. And that's great. But the, uh, the saying is you can never out exercise an unhealthy diet. Because if you think about one donut is 300 calories, you have to run three miles just to put off that donut. It's better just to eat an apple, which is only 100 calories. And then it saves yourself 200 calories or two miles of exercise. So it was a big mistake. And uh, really focusing on the healthy eating is by far the, the most important aspect of, of lifestyle medicine. So what do you say to people who talk about their illnesses coming from their genes or because it's in their DNA? That is an excellent question. I get that all the time. My dad had heart disease, my uncle had heart disease, I'm going to get heart disease, right? And the same thing's true for high blood pressure, obesity, and diabetes. What we always say is the genes might load the gun, but your diet and your lifestyle pulls the trigger. So there are certain types of genes that you can control and certain types you can't. You cannot control things like eye color, hair color, skin color, how tall you are, are you male or female? You, for the most part, you can't control those. Uh, however, uh, genes for obesity, for high blood pressure, for type 2 diabetes, 
if you do all the right things, you don't need to manifest those genes. You don't need to express them. So the great example that I personally have been through is knowing that growing up on a standard American diet, very unhealthy, all my family became obese and morbidly obese, but our neighbors next to us, they were thin, yet they ate the same unhealthy diet as us. So we just kind of thought, oh, we're a genetically obese family, right? But now that we've all changed our diet, we're all plant-based, we've all lost weight, that kind of shows that your lifestyle choices are way more important than the genes that you're born with, essentially all the time. Mm, that, that truly does make sense to me. And I think as human beings, we try to come up with excuses as to why we are the way we are, when actually there is what we're gonna talk about today, wait, there are ways to prevent you know, the, these illnesses in the first place, so. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the biggest concept in lifestyle medicine, that, that the biggest, honestly, the biggest secret in, in all of medicine is that the default state of the human body is simply to be healthy. The human body doesn't want to develop disease. It doesn't want you to gain weight. It doesn't want diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, or heart disease. Those things only develop if we actively do something to harm our body, if we consume processed foods, animal-based foods, if we're sedentary, if we smoke cigarettes. And the key to good health is actually removing the thing that's causing the harm. And the body has an absolute amazing way of healing itself up. And the great analogy for that is if you just took a knife and cut your skin and sat back and did nothing, your body stops the bleeding, forms a scab, and eventually forms a scar in two, three, or four weeks. But if you kept cutting your skin in the same place over and over again, three times a day, you never give the body the opportunity to heal. Well, our arteries on the inside and many other systems are really no different than the skin on the outside, but we continuously injure our arteries and other parts of our body, breakfast, lunch, and dinner with the food that we eat and, and other unhealthy activities. Just stop causing the injury and let the body heal itself up. And that's true for heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, many autoimmune disorders, neurologic disorders, a very long, long list of, of different chronic diseases. The best kept secret in all of medicine, no question. That is a great analogy of, of yes, how people think, I, I agree. I wonder if uh, the inside of our bodies were visible, would we be more prone to to take care of the, you know, these fantastic engines that we're blessed with rather than abuse them, I guess. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, one of the great ways that we get people to stop smoking is showing them scarred lungs and lung tumors. And they look at that and they go, oh, geez, that doesn't look good and really funny. Um, in the vegan world, I actually have heard some vegan doctors say that when they know a patient needs a plant-based diet and wants to do a plant-based diet, they show them slaughterhouse videos. What's the expression? If slaughterhouses had glass walls, everybody would be vegetarian, right? Not just seeing what's going on the inside in your lungs and your arteries, but seeing what's going on the outside also can, can help people follow a more plant-based diet. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Loam, uh, we do have some slides and graphics that I do want to go through that you've been um, you have prepared for us. Let's take a look at the first one. So basically, this is just an introduction slide, which uh, kind of shows the general concept in, in a great picture that you really have two roads you can take. One road, you go off to the left and you eat your fruits, vegetables, beans, whole grains, nuts and seeds, a healthy plant-based diet. And you should be healthy, not develop these chronic diseases. But the other, other way is the way Western medicine is. There's a pill for everything. It doesn't treat the cause of the problem. That is when pills accumulate, side effects accumulate, and bad things can happen, heart attacks, strokes, cancer, so many, many types of cancers, et cetera. People really do have that choice one way or the other. Mm, that's interesting. I, I don't know if you know, but I actually lived in Japan for 30 years. Oh, wow. I'm yes, I'm originally from Australia, Australia being um, unfortunately on par with America in terms of um, the percentage of people with obesity, diabetes, etc. But Japan, on the other hand, the country where they eat a lot of whole foods, incorporate a lot of, you know, fresh fruit and vegetables in, into their diet are, are quite um, clearly doing something better. So I'm yeah, interested no, to hear about, yes. Yeah, about no question. On, well, um, the Okinawan diet uh, historically is considered arguably the healthiest diet ever, which is very interesting. It's 97% plant-based historically. Now, of course, it's 
westernized a little bit, but if you look back, uh, about 65% of calories in the traditional Okinawan diet were sweet potatoes, just plain sweet potatoes, not with marshmallow and butter all over it like Americans tend to do, just sweet potatoes. And then 25% was rice, 7% fruits, vegetables, beans, legumes, and only 3% animal-based. And what's really interesting is the, the rice that they ate was actually white rice, which we usually don't consider very healthy, but I guess there's worse things. And they had the lowest protein diet ever described in any culture, the lowest protein diet. But America has this huge fixation on protein, 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 when really we are all over protein. And there's such a big concern because most people are getting their protein from animal-based sources, which carries baggage of cholesterol, saturated fat increases, other harmful components such as TMAO and insulin-like growth, growth factor, which can promote cancer growth. We don't want to be getting our, our protein from animal foods. We want to be just like those Okinawans and, and be as plant-based as we possibly can be. Oh, absolutely. You know, as a vegan, you can imagine, and, and yourself, Dr. Lohm, probably get asked all the time, the, the, the question that, that never, never disappears, where do you get your protein from? Yes, yes, and, all and the time. I, I think, yeah, I think uh, exactly what you said. It's kind of a misconception that people who eat meat get their protein from meat. I, I, I think it's clear people don't understand that protein comes from plants. Yeah, so absolutely. Animals get it from the same source that yeah. vegans do. Yeah, all protein initially comes from plants, the strongest animals in the world are elephants, gorillas, rhinos, buffaloes. Okay. They're, they're all 100% plant eaters. And to think that you need to eat the muscle of an animal to build your muscle and make proteins is kind of like thinking you need to eat the brain of a smart person to get smart. It doesn't, doesn't make sense. You don't eat somebody's eyeballs to improve your vision. You don't need to eat an animal's muscle to build your muscle. You can actually get protein from you know, beans and, and legumes. And if you ever want to see a lot of the science behind it and some great examples of elite athletes that eat 100% plant-based, the documentary to watch, of course, is The Game Changers. It's on Netflix. It's very powerful. Mm, yes, that's an awesome documentary for people to to see, to learn about um, more about how it actually works. And another uh, documentary that you do recommend is Forks Over Knives. Yeah, Forks Over Knives actually is the initial plant-based documentary that mm -hmm. opened my eyes uh, when I was trying to lose weight, focusing on exercise, and then following the USDA dietary guidelines, uh, food pyramid, you know, with uh, chicken, fish, low-fat dairy products, olive oil. I was kind of uh, blinded by the fact that all those USDA dietary guidelines are very much politically influenced, money influenced, and uh, Forks Over Knives really opened it up for me to realize you don't need to eat animal-based foods to live. When you do eat them, you get the baggage of the cholesterol and saturated fat. They're higher in calorie density in general, and always higher in fat, even the leanest meats is high, way higher in fat than any bean or any lentil that you could possibly find. And just simply the fact that you know, you don't need to eat animal-based foods to live. The American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics has a statement on that that says a 100% plant-based diet, as long as it's well-balanced, is nutritionally adequate for all stages of life, including pregnancy. My wife has had two pregnancies, 100% vegan, with two children, 100% vegan. It's fine for breastfeeding, adolescents, childhood, elderly athletes, everybody. So uh, Forks Over Knives really did uh, it change my life, no question. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I, I remember seeing that as well and thinking the same thing. It still blows my mind that people are not making the connection and understanding how, how simple the answer to this is. When you go plant-based, you can really fix a lot of things or prevent a lot of things. We're going Absolutely. To, we, we, are, we are going to um, really delve into this with Dr. Stephen Lohm. Please uh, stay tuned. We're going to have a quick break and be back with more about preventing disease with plants.
Aloha, welcome back everyone again to Lillian's Vegan World. I'm your host Lillian Kumik, vegan chef and cookbook author. My uh, recently released cookbook is called Hawaii, A Vegan Paradise. It's available in stores all around Hawaii on Amazon, Barnes and Noble with free shipping uh, for members. So do do grab a copy if you come across it. I've veganized Hawaiian favorites and there are over 120 plant-based recipes in the book. So do check it out. I'd like to wel welcome back to the show again, my awesome guest from California, Dr. Stephen Loam. Welcome back, doctor. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. There's so much to learn from you and, and your studies and, and what, what you have to share with us today. So I do wanna go straight into the next slide. Let's have a look at it. So I'm a cardiologist. And what this slide really emphasizes is the huge burden of cardiovascular disease. That yellow circle is on average on, per year, the number of people who die from heart disease and stroke, which is the same mechanism, clogging of arteries. And when you compare that to the amount of people who die from other things like murder, war, and suicide, pregnancy, and birth complications, that's a very small number. Yet the crazy thing about cardiovascular disease is we have essentially a cure for it. A healthy lifestyle with a plant-based diet, regular physical activity, don't smoke cigarettes, et cetera. We could annihilate the number one killer in America. It's been the number one killer for more than a hundred consecutive years. Why is it if we can prevent nearly all heart disease and even treat it with a lifestyle medicine approach, why haven't we done it? Why is heart disease still the number one cause of death? Mm. And you're going to share with us your thoughts about why that is. Let's take a look at the next slide. And this is pretty much why. Uh, mm -hmm. Culture and money. Our American culture is very much into processed foods, way too many animal-based foods. You know, any barbecue is ribs and potato chips and soda pop. And that's just the way our culture is. We're very much an unhealthy food. And honestly, money might actually be the bigger driving force because the food industry is a multi-trillion dollar industry in America. The pharmaceutical industry is almost a trillion dollar industry and the healthcare system is a four trillion dollar industry in America. And if you think about a healthcare system that's based on making money, you go back a hundred years and say, let's, let's develop a capitalistic healthcare system. There's only gonna be two rules. Number one, you don't want healthy people because if everybody's healthy, you can't make money, right? Number two, you don't want dead people because if they're dead, you can't make money. So it's just naturally resulted in a system where we don't cure disease, we don't reverse it, we maintain it. And how do we maintain it? With expensive therapies like pills, surgeries, we order a lot of tests, we need to see the doctor a lot. So really culture and money are the two main reasons why a lifestyle medicine approach, a plant-based diet has not been emphasized in our healthcare system. And people's eyes are opening up, but we need to really come together and make this change, make a complete paradigm shift. Mm. The, the truth is quite shocking, isn't it? When you think about it, why, why do you think people are not jumping on board the plant-based wagon and going for it, knowing all this, all this information is out there? It's, it's very clear to all of us. What is stopping people well, from it's, moving it's, ahead? really confuses me as well. I think a lot of it is misinformation. Again, a, a lot of money influences because the other industries, the animal-based foods, dairy, egg industry, they publish their research to try to confuse people. The politicians take money from industry sponsors. And so we don't change government policy. You look at the USDA dairy, dietary guidelines, which still has significant animal-based foods and dairy. Unlike Canada, which removed dairy as a food group and emphasizes plant-based protein sources over animal-based protein sources. So uh, of course, again, our, our culture uh, fights it. And you know, honestly, our brain fights it, right? Uh, because unhealthy food tastes great, uh, sugar, salt, and fat. That's just the way we evolved to get adequate calories so we wouldn't starve and die. But now those mechanisms that we have are working so much against it. It, make it makes it very hard to change. Yeah, I, I agree. It's crazy how how, the, how these industries, the, the meat, dairy industry, have so much influence over what we eat. It, in, in a sense, it's bizarre to think that people actually consume cow milk, for example, something so simple as that. Yet, if you were to ask someone, then why don't you um, go for a milk that has more calcium, like a monkey milk or I don't know, a uh, rat milk or something. And you can just see their faces. They're just yeah. disgusted by the thought. But at the same time, it's like, how is it that a, an adult human being 
goes to a different animal to drink milk when we don't even, that's like an adult human going to the breast of a woman to try and take her breast milk as an adult. It just doesn't add up. And it's kind of, it's quite frustrating at times to see how people are not getting what we're getting, like it's not clicking. And, and there's many things that, that don't click. And, and from the other perspective, we love dogs and cats. We eat pigs and chickens. And yet they're, they're still sentient beings. Why not eat your dog and, and eat your cat, which some cultures do, right? So it, it's mm-hmm. a big disconnect that we have. It's a huge definitely, disconnect. Definitely is. Uh, let's take a look at the next slide. And so this actually just emphasizes some of those points. In America, the economy is about 20% healthcare spending, and we tower over every other country in regards to the percentage of our gross domestic product that we spend on healthcare. And what's crazy is despite all this money that we spend, America has the lowest life expectancy of all industrialized nations, despite spending this much money. It's just completely wrong. The lowest paid doctor in America is a preventative medicine specialist. You get paid less for preventing disease. We get paid more for fixing it with surgeries and maintaining it with drugs. The top paid doctor in America is actually a cosmetic surgeon, kind of a backed up, screwed up system. It shouldn't really be that way. That is, that is very screwed up. And now yeah. that you point, point that out, yes, I, I see <laughs> what you mean. Yeah. Plastic surgeons are just some of the richest people in the world. They are, yeah. What? How, how did it how did it come to this point where where we've become so easily sucked in to 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 continue on like this? Well, what do you say? What do you, um, sorry to interrupt, Dr. Loam, What do you say to parents who are bringing up their children in this day and age and still feeding them dairy and meat and encouraging them, encouraging them to you know enjoy those burgers or the fast food? What, how do you yeah, start, a, even a, start to educate people? It, it's, a, it's a challenge. And I think you just need to uh, just, first of all, it is all just education. You need to say, look at the rates of obesity and overweight, especially in children. But 80% of adult Americans are overweight or obese. Half, Almost half of uh, adult Americans are pre-diabetic or diabetic. 70% of adult Americans over the age of 50 have high blood pressure. The foundation for heart disease and all these other disorders starts in childhood. Plaque starts in three-year-olds. You know, they could have fatty street cholesterol plaques in their arteries. So the sooner you start, the better they're going to be health-wise, but also developing those healthy habits is just so critically important. And it is real hard to get the kid to eat their vegetables, but we need to remember as parents, we decide what the kids eat. They don't decide. You don't let your, just like you don't let your kid decide whether or not they're going to go out and drive the car or play with a knife or something like that. No, you decide for them. Well, you know what? You need to decide what they eat too. And if they give a little tantrum, too bad. They need need to eat their vegetables. They shouldn't be eating their chicken nuggets. And you need to make that decision for them. I have six children that are all 100% plant-based. They're healthy. They're thriving. They're doing great. Mm, That's interesting. And yeah, it, it it is quite crazy when you think that adults or parents, I should say, are supposed to be leading by example, yet the example that they're leading is often not a healthy one. Very true. Uh, you have six children. Yes. Between the and ages of two and 14. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And, and all vegan, you mentioned. All vegan, 100%. My wife as well. My wife is family medicine physician. Fantastic. May I ask how your um, children interact with other kids at their schools? Well, recently it's been online and not in person, uh, but honestly, it, um, it's, it's becoming much more accepted, uh, much more accepted. Uh, my oldest uh, 14-year-old daughter actually has multiple friends that are vegetarian and, and vegan. And uh, honestly, the kids have been fine with it. I've asked uh, the older two who are in middle school many times, have you ever been made fun of? Has anybody ever said anything to you about the lunch that you bring? And no, they never have. And my daughter's actually given multiple uh, presentations on, you know, why you shouldn't eat pigs and things like that. And wow. she has a YouTube channel where she does cooking and stuff as well. And she's been a, a strong advocate and never once had any, uh, any harsh criticism from peers, although I'm sure it's, it's possible. So far, so good. I think it's becoming um, a lot more accepted. That's fantastic. Um, please tell her I'd love to have her as a guest on my show. <laughs> <laughs> from one chef to another up and coming one. <laughs> Thank you. She That's loves fantastic. to bake. 
Yeah. Oh, awesome. I did, I did notice on your Facebook page. Uh, speaking of your Facebook page, Dr. Lerm, how can people find you? Yeah, so Facebook, it should be facebook.com backslash Dr. Stephen Loam. Uh, I'm also active on, on Twitter. And um, you can always uh, send me a message through heartstrong.com, which is a, a free website that's up there in order to kind of uh, educate people about heart disease prevention and get them on a good, a good path. You also have a YouTube channel? Yeah, you just search Stephen Loam on, on YouTube. I haven't been as active with it uh, recently, but I put a lot of videos up on prevention and reversal of heart disease and my takes on, on other uh, different topics that have popped up over time. And I hope to become more and more active on that. Fantastic. Um, let's take another look at or another slide. So yeah, basically this slide is just emphasizing the paradigm shift that we really need. Right now we have an acute care model in our medical system where you see a doctor, you have 10 or 15 minutes with the doctor, they only have time really to prescribe medications. They can ask you, what are you eating for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? That just takes too much time. And that was a great model when the main thing that was going on when people got infections, need antibiotic, they had a laceration. That's awesome. But for chronic diseases like heart disease, diabetes, and high blood pressure, an acute care model with 10 or 15 minute appointments really, it just doesn't work. What we need to do is shift to a different system, a chronic care model, a lifestyle medicine model, where you not only see a doctor, but a nutritionist, an exercise specialist, a psychologist to help you with food addiction and stress relief and get you good sleep, a whole care team. We need to get paid for prevention. I actually get a bonus every year my patient doesn't have a heart attack or a stroke. If I get them off medicines, if I get them to lose weight, that's what I should get paid for. Instead, as we said before, I get paid more. The sicker my patient is and the more they need to see me for medicines, tests, surgeries, et cetera. But it's just backwards. Yeah, it's very, it's very messed up and bizarre indeed. Yeah. Um, let's take a look at another slide. So this actually just shows the dismal state of nutrition in the United States. This is according to the USDA. The green portion of this pie graph is the 12% of calories in America that come from unprocessed plant-based foods. And that half so of that, shocking. and half of that is tomatoes from French fries and or potatoes from French fries and tomatoes from ketchup. Half of that is. And so only 6% of calories come from fruits, vegetables, beans, whole grains, like we should be eating. And so 63% of calories come from processed oils, refined carbohydrates like white flour and sugar. It, it's, it's ridiculous. And 25% animal-based foods. Really, you know, in the ideal situation, we should have 100% of calories from unprocessed plant-based foods, zero from processed foods, zero from animal-based foods. It, it, it's crazy. Honestly, I, I recommend every anyone who's watching the show to start um, thinking about what you're putting into your body and stop focusing on the obsession with protein. Because every yep. time we start bringing up the topic of the plant-based diet, it's like, oh, you know, that that protein, where they get, where do you get your protein from? And looking at the statistics that you showed just now, over 60% of the calories coming from processed food, it's no wonder we are so sick. Absolutely. It's very true. Mm. Dr. Loam, uh, it, it has been honestly a pleasure having you on. This time has flown by. Um, at some stage in the future, I would be honored if you could come back and talk more about, you know, about how it all works and you'll give us your medical advice and expertise. It's been fantastic meeting to you, uh, meeting you and listening to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure and I'd love to come back. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Loam. And to everyone else out there, please consider everything Dr. Loam shared with us about, you know, a plant-based diet. I, I am genuinely passionate about sharing sharing more more topics more um more information like this so do take care stay safe stay healthy regain your health and watch some documentaries like um, the game changer or forks over knives thank you so much uh, from the team at think tech hawaii as well aloha